Hello everybody, well I just started my channel, so I figured I would post something and having nothing to ramble about today and nothing to review, I figured that I would start things off with a boom. As they say, I was going to read Chuck Palinwick's infamous fainting story, uh, Guts, that causes people to allegedly faint when they hear it, but that got to be almost 25 minutos in recording, and that was, that was painful. That was just quite painful. I, I flinched in sympathy pain many a time, so I guess if I get requests, I can subject myself to recording that, but as it stands for today, I am going to do a reading. I am going to read The Book of Sand by George Louis Bourget and translated by Andrew Hurley. <clears throat> Alright, let's see if I can read this correctly. This is The Book of Sand. Welcome to Kindly Blind Theater. The line consists of an infinite number of points, the plane of an infinite number of lines, the volume of an infinite number of planes, the hypervolume of an infinite number of volumes. No, no, this, more geometrical, is decidedly not the best way to begin my tale. To say that the story is true by now, no, this more geometrico is decidedly not the best way to begin my tale. To say that the story is true is, by now, a convention of every fantastic tale. I live alone in a fifth-floor apartment on Calle Belgrano. Mine, nevertheless, is true. One evening, a few months ago, I heard a knock at my door. I opened it, and a stranger stepped in. He was a tall man with blurred, vague features, or perhaps my nearsightedness made me see him that way. Everything about him spoke of honest poverty. He was dressed in gray and carried a gray valise. I immediately sensed that he was a foreigner. At first I thought he was old, then I noticed that I had been misled by his sparse hair, which was blonde, almost white, like the Scandinavians. In the course of our conversation, which I doubt lasted more than an hour, I learned that he hailed from the Orkneys. I pointed the man to a chair. He took some time to begin talking. He gave off an air of melancholy, as I do myself now. I sell Bibles, he said at last. In this house, I replied, not without a somewhat stiff, pedantic note. There are several English Bibles, including the first one, Wycliffe's. I also have Cipriano de Villara's, Luther's, which in literary terms is the worst of the lot, and a Latin copy of the Vulgate. As you see, it isn't exactly Bibles I might be needing. After a brief silence, he replied, It's not only Bibles that I sell. I can show you a sacred book that might interest a man such as yourself. I came by it in northern India. Beacon Air. He opened his valise and brought out the book. He laid it on the table. It was a cloth-bound octavo volume that had clearly passed through many hands. I examined it. The unusual heft of it surprised me. On the spine was printed Holy Writ and then Bombay. 19th century, I'd say, I observed. I don't know, was the reply. Never did know. The characters were unfamiliar to me. The pages, which seemed worn and badly set, were printed in double columns, like a Bible. The text was cramped and composed into versicles. At the upper corner of each page were Arabic numerals. I was struck by an odd fact. The even-numbered pages would carry the number 40, 
514, let us say, well, the odd-numbered page that followed it would be 999. It was at that point that the stranger spoke again. Look at it well. You will never see it again. There was a threat in the words, but not in the voice. I took note of the page and then closed the book. I turned the page, and the next page bore an eight-digit number. It also bore a small illustration, like those seen in dictionaries, an anchor drawn in pen and ink, as though by the unskilled hand of a child. Immediately, I opened it again. In vain, I searched for the figure of the anchor, page after page. To hide my discomfiture, I tried another tack. This is a version of scripture in some Hindu language, isn't that right? No, he replied. Then he lowered his voice, as though entrusting me with a secret. <laughs> I came across the book in a village on the plain, and I traded a few rupees and a Bible for it. The man who owned it didn't know how to read. I suspect he saw the book of books as an amulet. He was of the lower caste. People could not so much as step on his shadow without being defiled. He told me his book was called the Book of Sand, because neither sand nor this book has a beginning or an end. He suggested I try to find the first page. I took the cover in my left hand and opened the book, my thumb and forefinger almost touching. It was impossible. Several pages always lay between the cover and my hand. It was as though they grew from the very book. Now try to find the end. I failed there as well. This, this can't be, I stammered my voice hardly recognizable as my own. It can't. Yet it is, the Bible peddler said, his voice little more than a whisper. The number of pages in this book is literally infinite. No page is the first page, and no page is the last. I don't know why they're numbered in this arbitrary way, but perhaps it's to give one to understand that the terms of an infinite series can be numbered any way, whatever. Then, as though thinking out loud, he went on. If space is infinite, we were anywhere at any point in space. If time is infinite, we are at any point in time. His musings irritated me. You, I said, are a religious man, are you not? Yes, I'm Presbyterian. My conscience is clear. I am certain I didn't cheat that native when I gave him the Lord's word in exchange for his diabolic book. I assured him that he had nothing to reproach himself for, and asked whether he was passing through the country. He replied that he planned to return to his own country within a few days. It was then that I learned that he was a Scot, and that his house was in the Orkneys. I told him I had great personal fondness for Scotland, because of my love of Stevenson and Hume. And Robbie Burns, he corrected. As we talked, I continued to explore the infinite book. Had you intended to offer this curious specimen to the British Museum, then? I said with feigned indifference. No, he replied. I am offering it to you, and he mentioned a great sum of money. I told him, with perfect honesty, that such an amount of money was not within my ability to pay. But my mind was working. In a few minutes, I had devised my plan. I propose a trade, I said. You purchase the volume with a few rupees and the holy scripture. I will offer you the full sum of my pension, which I have just received, and Wycliffe's black leather Bible. It was left to me by my parents. A black leather Wycliffe, he murmured. I went to my bedroom and brought back the money in the book. With a bibliophile zeal, he turned the page and studied the binding. Done, he said. I was astonished that he did not try to haggle. 
Only later was I to realize that he had entered my house, already determined to sell the book. He did not count the money, but merely put the bills into his pocket. We chatted about India, the Orkneys, and the Norwegian Jarls that had once ruled those islands. Night was falling when the man left. I have never seen him since, nor do I know his name. I thought of putting the Book of Sand in the space left by the Wycliffe, but I chose at last to hide it behind some imperfect volumes of The Thousand and One Nights. I went to bed, but could not sleep. At three or four in the morning, I turned on the light. I took out the impossible book and turned its pages. On one, I saw an engraving of a mask. There was a number in the corner of the page. I don't remember what it is now. Raised to the ninth power. I showed no one my treasure. To the joy of possession was added the fear that it would be stolen from me, and to that, the suspicion that it might not truly be infinite. Those two points of anxiety aggravated my already habitual misanthropy. I had but few friends left, and those I stopped seeing. A prisoner of the book, I hardly left my house. I examined the worn bindings and the covers with a magnifying glass and rejected the possibility of some artifice. I found that the small illustration were spaced at 2,000 page intervals. I began noting them in an alphabetized notebook, which was very soon filled. They never repeated themselves. At night, during the rare intervals spared me by my insomnia, I dreamt of the book. Summer was drawing to a close, and I realized that the book was monstrous. It was cold consolation to think that I, who had looked upon it with my eyes and fondled it with my ten flesh and bone fingers, was no less monstrous than the book. I felt it was a nightmare thing, an obscene thing, and it had defiled and corrupted reality. I considered fire, but I feared that the burning of an infinite book might be similarly infinite and suffocate the planet in smoke. I remembered reading once that the best place to hide a leaf is in the forest. Before my retirement, I had worked in the National Library, which contained 900,000 books. I knew that to the right of the lobby, a curving staircase descended into the shadows of the basement, where the maps and periodicals are kept. I took advantage of the librarian's distraction to hide the Book of Sand on one of the library's damp shelves tried not to notice how high up or how far from the door. I now feel a little better, but I refuse to even walk down the street that that library is on.